Okay, my name is Martin Grassmeter. Uh, I joined RCA in uh, 1979. I was uh, hired in from uh, Air Neutronic Ford out in uh, uh, California and uh, was hired for the uh, Maroon Archer program. Okay. Uh, I'm Joe Springer. I started in 76 and uh, I started on the Maroon Archer program too. And I'm Fred Barnum, and uh, I started in uh, 1984 after a five-year tour in the United States Army. And I was hired in as the business development uh, representative supporting these two gentlemen here and others. Okay. So, let's talk about where you worked in RCA, what were the... Uh, you know what were, what was the job that you that you were doing and then what were your experiences um, since I started first what the heck uh, in 1976 I came in uh, out after uh, Pilko decided to leave for the West Coast and left me here uh, and went to work on the Maroon Archer program for Jim Feller um, the fellow that recommended me was an old Philco guy, Mark Gelman, and if you haven't interviewed him, you ought to grab a hold of him. He lives in Philadelphia. Uh, I worked on a, initially worked on a job called the Data Distribution Network, and that occupied a couple of years to, to wrap it all up. I was uh, to make about, uh, at that time, 24 computers interoperate with each other. At the time, it was the biggest, fastest inner computer switch uh, in the world, and today it'd be a joke. You know, <laughs> just that kind of change in the technology. Um, after that, uh, I started on something called uh, Goldspur, which was the first all digitized, all digital demodulator for NSA. All my work has been for classified organizations, mostly NSA, and a lot with the Army. Um, let me see, uh, when when did we start working on, were you working with me on Goldspur? I, forget. I was, okay. I was, but I think it was already ongoing when I started in 84, yeah. so I think it started maybe a year or two earlier. Okay, yeah, it's one of those things that right? never dies. Uh, <laughs> anyway, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun, we put together a team mainly uh, with a lot of uh, guys from RCA. When I, when I first walked in to RCA, I said, who do I work for? And somebody said, we don't know. <laughs> and I asked the secretary to reserve the conference room for me, because I didn't have an office. <laughs> and the fellow named Nissen Sher, one hell of an engineer, came over to me and he showed me this piece of paper and he said, we're working for you, Joe. I said, well, you never want up on me. <laughs> and another fellow I worked, worked with, when this one came from Philco, uh, another fellow who came from Philco, Frank Applebaum, was in the same group. Uh, Don Kaplan. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a circus. Uh, <laughs> The same group sort of merged into this uh, Goldspur thing later on. The short day was seven o'clock on Sunday, not seven, four o'clock on Sunday. Was, we had coffee brought in, uh, donuts brought in every day until it was finished. We were in a shootout with another company. We won the shootout. They were betting against us down at NSA. Uh, it took us, uh, they had a, a one year program to do it and they fired the other company in seven months. Uh, we were really happy with that program. Uh, Don Webster ran the, ran the show at that time. Don was probably the best uh, uh, business area manager that I could possibly imagine. He was, sorry Jim, he was a fantastic <laughs> guy. <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, he, he would move heaven and earth to keep that program moving. One day, the uh, uh, air conditioning went out. I said, we have to quit, we can't work OT tonight, the computers are breaking. 
And he said, just a second. And about an hour later, he was breaking through the walls. He got these guys who were breaking through the walls, and they put in ductwork to the next office over. The ductwork was like, <laughs> and we kept working. <laughs> it was a good time. Marty, when did you join these? Well, I, I well actually, I joined RCA in '79, as I said, but I came from Fulco also. But I was on the West Coast. I was running a program out there called Auditin 2, and Auditin 1 had been an RCA program, and uh, Fulco took Auditin 2 away from uh, RCA. So, And when I was there, RCA took Maroon Archer away from WDL, or Auditronics. So I was hired in uh, to take uh, Maroon Archer to the field, to implement, implement it into the field. And that's okay. what I did got it uh, up and running and so forth. And then I took over as a business area director. I was primarily program management all of these years and uh, and the early part. And then eventually I moved over into business development too. And that's when I really started supporting Joe uh, was from a business development standpoint with the, uh, with the Army. So, okay, well we can't talk much about Maroon Archer, but we can talk about uh, the experience with uh, Joe and the Army and uh, the oh, business yes. development, and you were brought in to support that. Yes, yeah, Joe mentioned uh, the group uh, that Joe and Marty and you and many others worked for here was called Information Processing Systems, which was a euphemistic term for the intelligence business. And our main customer, as Joe said, was the National Security Agency. But when I was hired in in '84. I came with some background from Army Intelligence and uh, had just returned from three years in Germany where I was actually helping to field new systems for the MI units over in Germany. So I had a little experience with Army tactical fielding of systems. They paired me up with Joe on like day one when I, when I arrived and I knew it was going to be magical from that point forward. I just, I just knew it. <laughs> I was in his office for about five minutes and we were cracking jokes back and forth and we like hit it off instantly. I don't know if you remember, but you know, nah. that's the way I remember <laughs> it. Now I'll get back to Joe in a second. Then Marty was right down the hall and Marty sat in one of the uh, front end offices and he was running several programs. I'm not sure what your title was at that time, I was but a, a director. You were a director, right? Yeah. yeah and you, uh, as you were saying before, Marv Gelman was also a director, and yep. George Sardarian was a yeah, director. Yeah, so I remember the directors. visual. Uh, Marty had the right. office on the right, right next door to him was George. Right. And then we had another guy named Roman Andercheck sitting over there on the left. Yeah, well, but Roman, we won't go there. Roman worked right. for me at the time. Right. Now, yeah. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so anyway, Joe had taken over a program that was very interesting, and it happened to be with the Army up at Fort Monmouth. And uh, the customer was known as the Electronic Warfare Laboratory, EWL. First thing Joe said to me was, hey, look, you know, customers come first. I go up there once a week. Even if I don't have a reason to, I make one up. So I'm with the customer at least once a week. And that's, I, I'll never forget those words he said to me because they're absolutely true. There's nothing that could substitute for customer intimacy and customer relationships. So Joe and I started to do our trips together up to Fort Monmouth, where I met the team of Army guys up at the EWL, including a great friend of ours to this day, John Cervini, who all three of us know very well. And John was the program manager, manager for an R&D job, research and development job, that was called the Modular Adaptive Signal Sorter, or MASS, was the acronym for it. And in layman's terms, uh, it was uh, the capability of a mass was that it uh, it took a very crowded environment of RF energy of signals, radio signals, and actually in this case it was non-com, it was more radar related signals, and could make sense out of a mess of different stuff, sort it all out, and give the operator a clear answer as to what a threat was that was imminent in a tactical environment. We started that project, I think it was in 79 as a company, correct? Yeah. It yeah. was uh, started way back in 79, so by the time I got involved in it, it had been going on for five years. You mm -hmm. had taken it over in 82, I think. Yeah, I, think. I came in 84. So 
we did some very neat stuff, Jim, with that box. And we, we were told at the time to work with a company on the West Coast known as Electromagnetic Systems Laboratory, or ESL. They had a contract with the same customer to make the front-end receiver that our processor worked with. And we were way ahead of our time, I would say, for Army technology, for anything for tactical technology, in what was known as ELINT, Electronic Intelligence. We were out, and thanks to this guy, because this guy didn't know the answer to, no, you can't do this. He would always figure out a way to get something done. And actually, he'd even go beyond that. He'd, he'd promise a customer anything the customer asked about, and then we'd get in the car and drive home, and I'd say, oh, how are we going to do this, Jim? And he'd go, I don't know. We'll figure it out. And then we'd go home, and he'd figure it out. And he'd pull the people from wherever the hell he had to pull them from within the organization and somehow magically come up with a solution, and we'd go out and build another box and he was great at building boxes, this guy, him and his team, his engineering team. And before you knew it, we had a prototype box to go take to the Army and test it. And we had a, ver a variety of, of uh, boxes that we built for them over those next several years. But the one thing that I do want to point out, today you see on the news every day unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, unmanned, uh, you know, from the smallest hand-thrown uh, little airplanes to full-blown uh, jet-sized ones like a Global Hawk UAV. Back in those days, the, the, they were known as RPVs, remotely piloted vehicles, and nobody was using them in those days. It was a it was a brand new technology. There were very few companies that built those things to begin with. We actually pulled off a live demonstration with the United States Army at Fort Hood, Texas, in 1987 using Joe's box with the other company's receiver and another company's antenna and we flew a, a it was called an RPV then, it was built by California Microwave around a full exercise in the Fort Hood, Texas area with our Army customers uh, operating a truck on the ground throwing out what were considered to be threat enemy radar signals and we found every one of them. We found every one of them and we just blew this whole thing right out of the water. The problem was, again, we were ahead of our time. So we had a capability demonstrated, and the Army did not have a formal requirement to field anything on a remotely piloted vehicle. I think the big problem and there was the Air Force was really against the UAV. Good point, Marty. Yes. They, wanted, they wanted to have a pilot on any aircraft that was right. carrying any... Uh, uh, weapon or uh, right. signal. Yeah, you're absolutely and right. We, we had a big that, problem yeah. with fighting that with the Air Force. And it wasn't really, the Israelis really got the the drone, uh, the UAVs really working. And that's what convinced Congress that they had to go that way. So Very what good did point. the three of you do out there to demonstrate this? Well, we started uh, originally building a... Um, a miniature system, and the whole thing had to fly on a uh, small plane, you know. So uh, we built a box maybe about like so. Uh, and it was a, a multi-microprocessor system uh, based on uh, a, a, a bus system uh, that could handle that kind of architecture. It was new to RCA, a matter of fact, pretty new to the world. Uh, we designed our own digital signal processors for it, uh, which is pretty neat. We designed our own operating system. And it's an operating system that could control multiple digital signal processors and multiple individual general purpose processors. And uh, uh, it, uh, it let me see, how do I want to put this? Um, the, the system, once in, the, the first system we were building it for was for a, a, a platform called the Aquila. Uh, oddly enough, it was also called the Lead Sled. Uh, yep. it, they had a hell of a time trying to keep it in the air. Yep. Uh, eventually, you, you know, fast forward the clock, it went on, 
uh, a uh, hunter, where did we run that test? It was 97, was it? Oh, the, well, the hunter came later, yeah. I mean, yeah. the first one was the California microwave, CM30. Yeah, that's right. Back in the 80s. Uh, and by the way, the transition of business development responsibility from me, Marty took over from me in 1990 when I moved to a different job at uh, Camden. And so Marty then picked up the the helm for all the business development efforts. And Marty got to experience a lot more of the neat field demos and all that kind of good stuff that I, that I unfortunately our, our, missed in the later yeah, years. Our problem at that point was trying to get the UAVs as an approved platform, mm -hmm. okay? And the Army didn't have the, uh, uh, the wherewithal to be able to do it because of the Air Force, they were uh, fighting it. But uh, eventually we went out and we, we did put it yeah. on the, uh, piloted aircraft out in the, uh, the desert, okay, out in uh, Arizona. And that was a uh, very good demonstration and uh, very successful. And we made a video of it and got a lot of And We used that video to get down to talk to Congress about, you know, getting the, uh, the drones funded and so forth. So Joe and I did most of our problems were we're fighting for the, the platform to be able to put this on. If you're interested, I have all of the videos that we ran uh, right from the original yeah uh but well the lead slide but the uh no we got the, the one fort from hood. fort hood we got the one from fort hood yes uh we got the uh the one from harkahalla plains uh when we flew out was that the queuing, the queuing demo in yeah that was the queuing demo yeah, right yeah uh, that's an interesting program we got it under an ideas program exactly that was something that i really push for to try and get that program funded. We had 24 hours to put together the proposal. And the trick on this proposal was uh, it had to have a high chance of failure. If there wasn't a high chance of failure, they weren't interested. They weren't interested. But it had to have a high payoff. This is perfect for this guy because he always went for the impossible. Always. So we, It was right up his alley. We got so, to have one. Of course you did. It was a lot of fun. This guy, by the way, I have to say something right here. And you know this too, because Jim ended up running the IPS group and mm -hmm. he lived the experience of this program. I always like to say that this program was the longest running research and development program in the history of the United States Department of Defense. <laughs> no kidding. When I, when I say that, it started you in 79. You finished up. Yeah. <laughs> it would finish and then it would just rear its ugly head the following year again under another name. Same customers. Come on, yeah. you did this. Yeah. You did this. Yeah. We ran continuously nonstop from 79 to 96. Unfortunately, in 96, there was a hiccup because yeah. our customer at that point was a guy named Frank Elmer and he had Died. a very weird accidental death. And um, everything just kind of stopped up there for a little while. Within the year, he had it started again under, uh, I think you had it under like a support contract. John Kaczynski. To get it going yeah. again, which then led, and if I'm taking some of your thunder, stop me, but led to these guys starting another program where they took the radar intercept work and applied it to the comms problem for radio frequency level stuff. And they convinced the same customer EW Laboratory to give them, how much did you get? $5 million? Uh, something like that. I don't know. A $5 million new contract to build a new box to put in the Hunter UAV, the RQ-5 Hunter UAV, which is still out flying today and became one of the staple aircraft of, of mm -hmm. the tactical military. And the thing that was really amazing to me, now I wasn't even here when they were doing this job, I was off doing something else. But I kept in touch with you guys, and they were telling me what was going on. They took the job, then they went, had to go out and take a look at the aircraft, correct? Yeah, well, it started out with the Predator. I went on vacation, yeah, but, and okay. it turned into the Hunter, which was the biggest mistake that the Army could ever make. But to, to give you a good example of how this guy operates, takes the contract, sight unseen of, of the specs of the aircraft this box had to go into. Hadn't built the box yet either, by the way. Goes out, makes a trip to where'd you go? Arizona to see the, the hunter you guys went out yeah. there? They're told, as with all UAV makers, 
oh, we don't build our UAVs in advance to accommodate payloads. We don't want you drilling anything on the outside of this thing. Here's your one little space that we'll give you. That's what they said to these guys. So they had a measure of space about like this in the back of the plane, and they had to come home and they had to force fit a design that would fit in that exact spot on that aircraft. And guess what? 18, how many months from start to finish? I knew I really flew. forget. I really it was forget. a little over a year, I think, wasn't yeah, it? Something like that. Which is pretty phenomenal when you think about it. So not only did they build the box, mm -hmm. they got it out to uh, Fort Huachuca, Arizona mm -hmm. area, and they successfully flew it. And this was okay. in 2000. Mm -hmm. One thing that I'd like to make was during this whole period, we got a lot of support from RCA Engineering mm -hmm. and yes. from the IR&D. Mm -hmm. We always got IR&D money. We always got B and P money to be able to pursue these things. That is and, true. You know, so it's uh, as Fred said, it took a long time, but we always got. And so the the corporation was always behind us, and that was one of the the, the big things that I think we we sold outside and we sold inside. Too. Marty brings up an important point. The reason we went into uh, communications combined with uh, radar intercept on this. Uh, last program um, was because we went into another NSA job called Bee Sting. Mass led the Bee Sting. Bee Sting led the, a combining of Bee Sting stuff and Mass stuff to make uh, Skyhawk. Yes. They're the three code names for the program. Mm -hmm. Bee Sting was a fantastic program. Uh, we got it mainly because uh, we knew how to do signal sorting and the real problem they had with uh, communications intercept in those days was how the hell do you handle millions of pulses per second and make any kind of sense out of it. Well, there were 15, no, excuse me, 12 competitors on that program. RCA didn't know anything about And the IR&D, we coughed up, RCA coughed up seven and a half million bucks for IR&D devoted to bee sting. We started from zero and built up a capability uh, to intercept. That IR&D took us from zero to winner. Uh, I'll never forget the awards conference. I sat back in the back of the room and the government guy said, when we first started this out, we never even thought that RCA had any kind of chance at all. I never expected to be standing here. And we won that job. Well, and and that, that really led to a number of other programs too in the, the multi-million dollar area that right. uh, uh, from the beast thing technology, so mm -hmm. that was a very good uh, investment that the, the company made in that, that iron day. I would go as far as to say there would be no IPS today if there were no beast thing. At the time, we were really down on our luck. When I kicked off that program, uh, I explained that to everybody. He says, "This is this is it. There isn't any other big job around. You better do this one right." You did have a remarkable way of <laughs> making a presentation that would win R&D. Now, I heard a story that said you were the longest running R&D program <laughs> in the Army yeah. because you would never let it go to production. You always <laughs> kept changing the complexion to a different thing and developing a different nuance. Is there anything to that? I think we were, I, I think we were convinced that the drone was the way to go. And that's what we were really waiting for. And we tried to, yes, but I'll let Joe get into that more. I, I did one production go program. Ahead. Try to answer that one. I want to I hear you. I did one production program. It was called Gwen. <laughs> we, we and built, that cured you. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> we uh, we had uh, we were we were the local experts in digital signal processing. 
the designer, uh, the main designer for the signal processors, by the way, was the son of one of the fellows you already uh, interviewed. The guy's name was Steve Noss, and fantastic. The father's name's Ed. Uh, so anyway, we put together uh, a, uh, a uh, signal processor that would work for Gwen. They had no other answer. We weren't even associated with those people across the street. And they came over and said, what can you do? And we said, well, here, this is what, and we designed it and said, this is what we can do. So we did it for them. And then we had to build it in production. And it drove me bats. Uh, he, he would come in and talk to me. I would be catatonic. You would, yeah, yeah. You weren't even responding some, some of the time. <laughs> But he loved the R&D world, Jim. Yes. <laughs> and I, I also heard something about when you were doing the, the Hunter R&D about somebody totally disrupting the entire airfield. Was, That'd be was to that. I wasn't there for that one. Well, I drove across the airfield out in, the, uh, in Arizona, and uh, Joe bailed me out of that. <laughs> the police caught up with me and took me in tow and that type of thing. And he didn't do it maliciously. He, right. he was just he trying to find his way back to find Joe again. I no, think. I was right. taking a shortcut. Oh, you were taking a shortcut. Uh, Never mind. Point. He's not so he didn't know what he was story. doing. Okay. Yeah, why don't you tell the whole story as long as the whole yeah, world we is were, watching now. Go ahead. We had to calibrate, we had to calibrate the uh, system. And the way you calibrate it is you turn on a, an emitter in the direction that you know is, is accurate. <laughs> So he had a truck full of radars, and I said, and we rolled up the, uh, rolled up the uh, uh, doors to the uh, air, to, the, to where, where we kept the uh, airplane. airplane, and I said, you know, go across the field and turn on the so radar. So he instigated it. There you go. So instead of using the perimeter road, man, he goes right across the field, across all of the, the air land airstrips. Air <laughs> The guys in the tower. <laughs> okay. Meanwhile, he comes back. Another fellow, Jeff Kesling, a great little guy, he helped us all along here. He goes over, and the cops go to him and say, "What are you doing, <laughs> driving across the field?" <laughs> so it finally winds up with the, our hosts uh, getting beat upon and having to put into place. A safe practices procedure for the next nine months. That's <laughs> what they give her host to us. And I, I got to also add in another little tidbit. Okay. Uh, my travels with Joe. Travels with Joe. It's like travels with Charlie, but it's Joe. This guy was a blast to travel with. It didn't matter where we were going. As a matter of fact, that was the fun about it. We didn't know where we were going next. We just say, okay, we need to go see the Air Force. Mm -hmm. Joe would say, go find somebody in the Air Force for us to go visit. Okay, we'd go to Wright-Patterson, mm -hmm. right? we'd go to Hanscom, we'd go to, and we would take our, our story of what we were doing all over the country, literally. And uh, some of that came in the form of attending conferences mm -hmm. where Joe and his customer, John Cervini, were like blood brothers. They would, they would co-author papers together and they would go out together to these conferences and present. Yeah. One time Joe would present it, the next time John would present it. I mean, again, I'll get back to this thing about customer intimacy. This guy did it better than just about anybody I ever met in my whole career here. And I've been working for this company 31 years now. Mm -hmm. So I was taught by the master right from the beginning here on customer relationships, and it served me well all these years. It was easy because we had really great customers. And that too. John Cervini, fantastic. Jeff yeah, Friedman. Very supportive. good technology yeah. that you were oh, yeah, pushing. Good technology. Yeah. Yes. And it was engineers right. talking to engineers. That That's really. true. That is true. Do you think you would have been able to pull this off in any other company? <laughs> <laughs> well, I... <laughs> Which one were you talking about? RCA, RCA, <laughs> No, let's yeah, let's let's qualify that. Uh, <laughs> no, I I don't, I don't think, think so, so because I think no. RCA was very technically oriented. Yeah. And when we were at Philco and Air and Electronic Ford and so forth, uh, you know, we didn't get the same response from a technical standpoint when you came up with a good idea. 
but I think here at RCA we always had uh, very tolerant. A, an ear yeah. of, very, uh, you know, for any good idea. And except for GA. Had. Yeah. Well, that's, that was going to be the next question. Did that change as we transitioned out of RCA? Yeah. Yes. Okay, because I, th I think that what uh, Jack Welch from GE wanted, he wanted to get rid of a whole level of management, middle management, and that forced us to change things around. And I don't think we got the same technical response from management uh, under GE as we were doing with RCA. Yeah, it was a whole different ball game. Yeah. And of course, there was a little delay in that because they bought RCA in 86, but they didn't even show up to Camden until January of 89. We were literally, I think, the last site in RCA that they actually sent their management into mm -hmm. to take over. So we got away with it a little bit longer after the, the new parent came in, but once the new management came in, it was a whole new ball game. Yeah. And people were called up on the carpet, you know, for program reviews and it was like a whole new world of, of grilling and cost and how are you tracking this and you know, where how much more profit am I gonna get out of this? It was totally, totally uh, financially driven. What goals. did the R what did the R and D money look like after that? Not not good. The, it dried up not to good. zero. They tried. They actually tried to put us out of business. I'm trying to think who was the GM at that time. Uh, well, it was Tom was Corcoran sequence. first. Corcoran. And he uh, was here from Gingrich. '89 to '90, and then Gingrich came in in '90 right. and was here through March of '93. Yeah, and and those were the lean years. Uh, when I'm we sorry, first started here at RCA, uh, John Rittenhouse uh, was the uh, was the CEO. He was he was a great guy. He graduated out of Drexel, same same school as me. Matter of fact, my boss Jim Feller and I were in uh, the cafeteria, and he stopped by, and I was introduced. He says, "It's about time you found somebody who could work." <laughs> because we were all co-ops out in Drexel. Uh, then uh, let me see. After that, it was Joe Howe. Joe Howe, right? And. Both those guys were engineers, and you could walk into their office any time. Matter of fact, they would come over and sit in on design reviews. I could, a number of times, how would sit there while we would talk about this and we were going to build the thing. You know, and he understood. Another way of putting they, they it. They were very technical, technically oriented, too. Because I remember Joe Howe interviewed me when I came in from Aaron Neutronics, and he wanted to know how I was able to take the Audit in Two program away from uh, uh, from RCA, and uh, you know how we were able to work that out with Western Union. So, but uh, you know they, they were technical people, and when we got into the the GE people, they weren't. They were management. And, uh, they were there to trim things down and save money. Yeah. Joe, I, you ought to also just give just a, a little background when we were talking about our earlier days on mass. Mm -hmm. Tell Jim and, and, and the folks a little bit about our guys that were up in Somerville. Oh, yeah. Couldn't have done it without uh, that was, Cal That Brooks. was a key piece. He, uh, he died last year. Good friend. Fantastic engineering staff. Uh, it was uh, Steve Nossen was probably their lead circus designer. Uh, and uh, then there was uh, Dominic and Basie. Um, let me see. Larry Murboth. Larry Murboth. Um, uh, there, Harbison come from there. No, too? Harbison was okay. a local hire, but it was sort of like a, a secret weapon. But, but explain what the <laughs> significance of the location and what they were doing there to your program was. Well, what what were they doing for, for they the were mass do, program? They were doing the digital signal processor design, mm -hmm. uh, and excuse me, there was no digital signal processing in mass. Started work working with them for Goldspur. Okay, that's when yeah. we became close friends, mm -hmm. and I understood their capabilities. Then when mass came in, went back up. That had sort of right. started that way, and when I got the mass program from the prior administration, I walked in and I looked at Steve and I said, Steve, he says, I'm sorry, Joe, they made me design it that way. So what we did was 
uh, and there was a lot of politics involved here. <clears throat> uh, we took the mass label off the box, took the box away and backed the new box up onto the label. At the time, there was another program going on where they had sold the Army on developing special <laughs> LSI logic chips. These are complex, uh, highly integrated circuits uh, to do things called pulse repiping and stuff that was came out where it all came from. But uh, the concept that was coming out of these chips, uh, I, w I was told I had to use the chips. And Austin and I, how are we going to do this and still build something that works? <laughs> so we. Uh, but as always, he figured it out. This guy, what the hell was the guy's name that uh, would come into all our design reviews and say, what about my chips? He was from the Army, that Army contract. Oh, God. I think. Oh, well. Anyway. Give me a second. Go ahead. He'll think. He's got a great memory. But uh, every time they would come in, I would say something like, well, there's a 50% chance we're going to put it on this board, <laughs> and maybe a 60% chance on this board, and the chance kept getting lower and lower and lower until right. it disappeared. And then finally, we put together an architecture that uh, is, was nothing sort of phenomenal. Uh, it, could, it, could actually, um, it could actually handle the rated 2 million pulses per second and do uh, histogramming of those pulses and through some unique uh, LSI logic at the front end and unique techniques, we were able to do things like take signals that were crappy, that is broken up signals, and Heal put them, them back together. We had yeah. a healing capability. We called it a pulsifier. <laughs> we had a... Yeah, we had a histogrammer that could anticipate what was going to happen next. Mm -hmm. uh, all those, it, it took about a dozen tricks to get that thing to work. It was remarkable. One reason we departed from our normal... And that was, by the way, that was done with uh, Cal Prost and his guys. Yes. One reason we departed from our normal interview method was because I think what keeps coming up over and over again when we interview people you know, what was so great about RCA mm -hmm. and it always comes up the people the team and then another term comes up the RCA family, family. so I kind of wanted them to see <laughs> so, some of the RCA oh family. yeah we're a family all right <laughs> dysfunctional like most um, families but we're a family but talk to me about the <laughs> RCA family well, we had a very uh, good esprit amongst all of us. We could do anything, we felt. And uh, yeah. I think that mm -hmm. uh, the, the RCA family was very important to us. And until GE came in and took us over, that's when that sort of dissipated and mm -hmm. so forth. And we thought GE just took us over because they wanted our pension plan. And NBC. And, uh, and NBC. They wanted NBC and uh, uh, the pension plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, So we weren't too happy about all that. But everybody, it was yeah. really the the Filco family back in those days. Yeah, I yeah. kind of when I came in, I kind of saw two families within that same couple of floors there in Eighth Building, right where IPS was headquartered out of. I saw one group that I didn't understand at first why they all knew each other so well and gelled like they did until I realized you guys were all former Ford Aerospace guys, mm -hmm. and I saw that 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 came together rather rather quickly in my mind. And then it was just the whole rest of the gang that worked in that building from, you know, the secretaries to the data management people to the security people to the engineers, the program mm -hmm. managers. There was no air of hierarchy in there. I never felt that mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I was 27 years old when I started in that job. And I was a lot younger than most of the people that worked there. But I was taken in, like, immediately from day one as a member of the family. And no matter what it was that had to be done, people would just stop what they were doing to help you finish something. Especially like a new guy like me, if I didn't know where something was, it didn't matter who I'd ask on the floor there up on 8-3, I'd mm -hmm. come in, 
right? You had Grace sitting up front there, mm -hmm. and Mary Green sat right next to her. They were just two gems of secretaries, those two ladies. And then there was Pete Pedersen, and then there was Don uh, Hoger, and I mean, the names are coming out as I'm thinking about them now. And that's that tells you something right there that I haven't even thought of some of these people in 30 years, but they're faces and names come right back to me as if it was yesterday and it was like it went beyond the office too okay hmm. you know and you guys know those christmas parties that we always had were the best they were the best we would have multiple christmas parties we had one just for our ips group there'd be one for all of camden right and there'd yeah. be ones for different disciplines like engineers would have their own and you'd have like several before yeah. before you'd go on holiday break and, it, well, and don't forget Christmas Eve. Why don't you tell that one? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm the interviewer. You tell me. Oh, uh, John Allen's party. Go ahead. Yeah, we would uh, we would suddenly have nothing but confidential work to to do, and that had to be done. <laughs> went behind had to be done on the 24th of December. <laughs> went behind the doors and uh, let's see what is this sparkling water? Yes, <laughs> and. Uh, uh, John Allen, yeah. to me, was always Father Christmas. I miss that man. Uh, they would have yeah. uh, poetry reading. Um, Carl Solomon's son would do Who's On First with his buddy. Uh, Carl Solomon's another funny guy. Every time I went yeah. to Chinatown with him, he would say, don't tell my son I ate the shrimp. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. <laughs> Then we have another, uh, uh, the Ballad of Sam McGee was uh, absolutely an essential uh, part of the, of the day. Right. It was, a, it was a very nice time. Everybody got, got along very well. And there was another party off campus at John Allen's house. He would host a huge blowout every year. Uh, looked forward to it all the time. Today we're and still well, friends. And, and we were talking about the Bee Sting program uh, for several years, three in a row, I think it was. I organized a softball uh, tournament. Right. For, mm -hmm. You remember that? Yeah. And we used to have it out in Cherry Hill at one of the fields, followed by a barbecue at either my house or one of the other guys' houses. And it was just such a like a such a team thing that just went beyond work. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with work, and, and that's how much we all loved each other. That we would just go out and have a good time wherever it was. It didn't matter. Yeah. Me and Don Hoger still see and, each other regular. And let's not forget mm. Maurice. And Maurice. We didn't mention Maurice here. Now, Maurice Timken was one of the best guys I ever met in my career. Great systems engineer. Great, fantastic systems engineer or program manager. He was customer oriented. He had such a personality, you, it was infectious. You'd be around him for five minutes and you couldn't help but just laugh along with everything he said and did because he had a great sense of humor too. I just saw him recently. We had the, the latest luncheon with Tony Rodriguez mm. and I hadn't seen Maurice for a while up until that, right. that day a couple of weeks mm -hmm. back. My God, the guy's, how old is he now? 90? How old is Maurice? No, I don't think he's oh, that old. Nice. Okay, it well, he's getting about close. 80, 84 or something. Now, he's not okay. young like us, though. Well, let me tell you something. I walked up behind him, Jim, and he hadn't seen me in a long time. And he just turned around and he goes, Fred, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> you know, and it was like he just, it was like, you know, I had just seen him the day before. And right. so he, he was a big, big part of that time period of the, uh, of the family environment that we had in IPS. Originally, uh, I did the IR and D for B Sting, and uh, did the in initial uh, qualification for for the contract, and then after the contract was let, then he gave the impossible task of actually I, building the damn thing to Maurice. I said, uh, "Yeah, I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going back to my R and D program here, Maurice. <laughs> Here's the plan. This is the box. Lead goes in here." Gold goes out here. You take care of the details. <laughs> that was the one time I did not see Maurice smile, by the way. So. <laughs> but they did. They were able to pull that. They did off. it. They did it. And a lot of it, well, most of it, just came right out of the mm -hmm. you know, the R and D mm -hmm. on that program. The way we sold it was we visited every every organization that, that had, had an any interest say in that. 
the award. Mm -hmm. We went up to MIT. Yep. We went to ESD. We went to down to uh, NRL. Uh, and what the one in Virginia for uh, the uh, guys that were in Virginia at the time. Uh, Army. 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 Signal Warfare Lab. Okay. Men's Combat. Uh, I, I forget the name of it now. It's slipping me. We went to, we visited the mall. Yeah. That was, and we made sure before we turned in the proposal that they understood how this thing worked. Mm -hmm. Yes. And there was not a surprise among them when we turned in that proposal. Right. They all knew how it worked, and that's why we got the job. Okay. And what was interesting was up at the MIT, MIT Lincoln Labs was a key uh, contributor to that evaluation. Mm -hmm. And I went up there one week and explained the signal sorter function in that program. And uh, they sat there politely listening to it, not saying much. Except for when I knocked over the coffee and spilled it on their evaluation. He was good at doing that in the meetings, by the way. <laughs> and the next next week, I went up to talk about uh, A to D converters, and not anything on beasting. They were doing some really fantastic A to D work. So I walk in, and the head guy there grabs a hold of me. He says, "It hit me." He says, "That's not a box. It's a concept." Come on down. He drags me down yeah. to another office. Were you there with me that day? Yeah. Uh, and I had to explain all over again. This is what, and that was a very typical reaction. The first time we explained the idea of that system to our own engineers it was the same damn thing. It's a there. Yeah, they didn't get okay. it at first. And two weeks later, it would be. Oh, you, ah. lived, you lived it too. Yep. You know, yep. You know what he's talking about. So now it was 10 yeah. years to get the concept. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can't ask you this question because you're not done yet. Right. But for the two of you, I want to ask you, you're retired. Talk about your career at RCA. Just a job? Oh, no. Or no. what? No. Describe it. Right. It, by by no means. It, it was really you were part of, uh, of, a, of a team. And you are really trying to, to push technology and push the state of the art and so forth. One other thing that I'd like to mention about the family, it wasn't just here at Camden. I think we cooperated between other divisions, like at Moorestown, mm -hmm. with yeah. the people up there, we cooperated with them, the people up in Massachusetts, who the heck were they again? Burlington. But Burlington, yeah. Sure. And, uh, sure. Uh, yeah, and so East we, we, we would come to help them and they would come to help us. And ATL. And, that was one of the things that uh, after I took over Maroon Archer, shortly after I took it over, I got a call from the chief engineer up in uh, uh, Moorestown and saying that he wanted Jimmy Sullivan back, who was our head engineer. He wanted Maurice Temkin back and a Don Nosifer, or Chuck Nosifer, and a few others mm -hmm. because he had loaned them to uh, Maroon Archer, to get Maroon Archer. 10 years earlier. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so he wanted him back. And I used some rather bold language in telling him, no Not way, happening. if he wanted them back, he had to go through Rittenhouse. And Rittenhouse had to direct me to give them up. So that was one yep. of the things. But other than that, we really did cooperate with other uh, okay. entities within the RCA family. So okay. we were all family. But you know, it was just a job for you, right? Right, right, right. Now, I, I'll tell you, I more than once, I uh, said I had the best job in the world. I was convinced of it. Conrad Haber, who was still working for this place, he and I used to sit across from each other and say, they're actually paying us to do this. Every Isn't day. It great? <laughs> it, was a, it was a tremendous amount of fun. One of the hardest things I ever did was retire. Uh, but there's more to life than work. That was the thing. Outside my office, uh, one of the engineers had actually keeled over at his desk at 55, and one of the engine, uh, one of the managers, his wife was 61 and she was dying, uh, and I was 60. I was approaching 60. And I said to myself, "Well, you know what? I got. I. You never know what the next day is going to bring." True. True. So. I retired. 
I'd and just uh, like to s suggest to you that maybe you were in greater danger when you were on your dirt bike in the forest than here. But <laughs> just he's still an enduro bike rider. I know, I know. Still. But I think we still <laughs> stay together, too. Yeah. We have the, the luncheons periodically. That's true. We see so each so other yeah. pretty regularly. Yeah. And we're interested now. to see what's happening down here, what yeah. L3 is currently doing yep. with the technology that we helped uh, to incubate and yeah. so forth. That's so, true. Yeah. Very true. And by the way, just to complete the story of the connection of all of us, right? In 95, I went off for, turned out to be a six-year period. I left Camden went to work for a different division of the same company out in Cherry Hill, the services group, the old RCA service right. company. And I did that job for six years. And in that sixth year, I get a call from this guy. And he says, uh, how you doing? I said, good, how you doing? He goes, good. He goes, yeah, we just had this really great demo out of Fort Huachuca on this Hunter UAV we were talking about earlier. He goes, uh, why don't you come back and take my job? I said, what are you talking about? He goes, I've had it. I'm done. I'm retiring. He goes, you want my job? I said, let me think about that. And I thought about it, and I said, you know what? It's kind of like meant to be that I came full circle mm -hmm. because I started as his business development guy way back when. He had unfinished business on the program, but he wanted to move on and do some other stuff. So it was only logical for me to come and fill in for him and that's what I did. And you were the one who hired me when I came back. And I came back in 2001, and I'm still here. And believe it or not, we're still working on a lot of very good <laughs> programs that have been an outgrowth of this guy's program right here. And that's, that's why a bunch of us are still employed here today.